Welcome to this forum for candidates for Washington State Senate Legislative District 2. I'm Liz Kernitz Thurlow, the moderator, and on behalf of the League of Women Voters of Tacoma Pierce County, League of Women Voters of Thurston County, and Thurston Community Media, TCTV, I welcome all to this virtual forum. The forum will be able to be viewed on TCTV, on YouTube, and the leagues will provide links on our websites. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan organization whose mission for the past hundred years has been to encourage the informed and active participation of citizens in government, hence candidates forums. Today's forum is for primary candidates for Senate in LD2. The primary election is Tuesday, August 4th, after which the top two vote getters will move on to the ballot for the general election. And that is why it's important to vote in primary elections. There are six candidates for this Senate seat. In ballot order, they are Matthew Smith, Josh Penner, Rhonda Litzenberger, Rick Payne, Jim McCune, and Gina Blanchard Reed. With us today are Matthew Smith, Josh Penner, Rhonda Litzenberger, and Gina Blanchard Reed. Our timekeeper is Terry Baker from the League of Women Voters of Tacoma Pierce County. She will hold up cards to let you know when you have one minute remaining. 30 seconds, 15, and when it's time to stop. When you see the stop card, you may finish a short sentence. Each candidate has up to two minutes for an opening statement. These will be given in ballot order. After that, the order of answering will rotate. All candidates will be asked all of the same questions. And at the end, closing statements may be up to one minute. So. Matthew Smith, your opening statement, please. So, I'm Matthew Smith. Um, I uh, decided to jump into the second LD Senate race. Um, I've been involved with the Senate for the last four years. I've been there as a session aide and sitting on the sidelines just uh, wasn't cutting it for me. Um, I was tired of talking about issues and not doing anything about it. Um, so I decided, you know, why not uh, go be a part of the action? Um, this spring has, uh, has been a pretty difficult one. And so um, we have a, you know, a government that doesn't uh, tend to do all the listening and they do all the talking. So uh, I decided to just, you know, stop complaining and, and put my nose to the grindstone and get out working for the people. Uh, we need to restore a voice, a voice of the people here in Washington state. And I'd, I'd like to be that voice. Thank you, Josh Penner. Thank you so much. My name is Josh Penner. I'm a father of three children. I'm a Marine Corps veteran and Iraq war veteran. And I've served my community of Ording faithfully for the better part of 10 years as a city council member and now as the mayor of Ording. I'm running for this position because we have an opportunity here in the state of Washington to, to really move in a, a very important direction as we're running up against critical issues. We have a an $8 billion shortfall in the budget. We have a situation between the legislature and the executive where there's not much communication. Here in the second district, we have a philosophy of way of doing things that's not very well represented Washington statewide. And so uh, my background working on regional leadership teams, representing cities in the Association of Washington Cities, working through planning issues at the local level, and of course, being a mayor during emergency uh, crisis situations, supporting our police departments, lowering our budgets, and returning money to our voters, I think is, is very, very um, important to the voters of our district. I'm asking them for their vote. And I think that there's gonna be some good conversation here today that's gonna demonstrate the differences uh, between me and the other candidates. Thank you so much. Thank you. Rhonda Litzenberger. Hi, I'm Rhonda Litzenberger. I am first and foremost mother of five children. They are truly my greatest accomplishment. My husband and I have been small business owners for over 30 years and during this time we have uh, weathered the Great Recession and despite being deemed non-essential for a time, we will weather the COVID-induced recession as well. We are in troubled times and as we face social, emotional and economic unrest, we know that in our hearts that every job is essential to the men and women that work so hard to provide for their families. A person's ability to strive for prosperity is essential to their purpose. For this reason, the number one thing we need to address at all levels of government is the economy. We must find ways to lighten the load for businesses by providing incentives, enabling them to hold on just a little bit longer. We need a Senator that's felt the burden of being responsible for an employee's paycheck. 
and knows the impact the recession will have on a business. I am passionate about property rights and making sure that we retain the full use and value of the property that we own. In order to truly tackle affordable housing crisis, we're gonna to have to look at land use regu regulations, water rights, growth management, and excessive taxation. And finally, we need to focus on effective, efficient education system that honors parents' rights. For almost 12 years, I've represented my community on a local and state level as a school board director. And as a member of the Legislative Committee for Washington State School Directors Association, I've gained a deep understanding and knowledge of the education funding, which comprises 52% of the state budget. I know the inequities and inefficiencies that need to be addressed. I've drafted legislative proposals, debated implications of policies, and most importantly, I've reached out to those that would be directly affected by the policies. I've worked shoulder to shoulder with elected officials from Seattle to Skamania. My experiences have given me an understanding of the inner workings of our state government. When it comes to small business issues, property rights, and education, I'm not gonna waste any time getting caught up to speed. I'm gonna hit the ground running. Thank you. Thank you. Gina Blanchard Reed. Good morning. I have lived in the second district for about 11 years. I have two young adult children. For the last 20 years, I've been involved in nonprofit work, working for organizations such as CareNet, Pregnancy and Family Services, the Boys and Girls Club of Thurston County, and currently I'm the executive director of the second largest domestic violence shelter in the state of Washington. So that's, that's really where my heart is, is serving the vulnerable and those that uh, need that safety net. As far as uh, politically, I am currently the fire commissioner from Graham Fire and Rescue. I uh, was appointed in 2016 and won an election in 2017. We serve 70,000 residents and uh, we uh, oversee a $28 million budget. I'm proud to say that Grand Fire was on the leading edge um, to the COVID response. We have great leadership with our chief and our board and have kept our community safe. I, I'm the only candidate that has both labor endorsements and business endorsements. And I, I value that because I think we all know that we're facing uh, an economy that needs to be restarted and, it's, and we have to work together and not just pay lip service to it. We have to have had that experience doing that. So that's something that I bring to the table. I'm very proud of my a wide, uh, broad, diverse uh, endorsement list. And um, I also was involved in the national convention four years ago. That's when I really decided that I needed to step up and, and serve my community in a, in a more effective way, in a way that um, is, um, is a sacrifice. I think all of us here on this panel know that uh, this right for office to the table. I also have been uh, told I'm very tenacious and uh, there's times when I think we need to compromise and we also need to know the art of persuasion and those are skills that I bring to the table. Thank you. Thank you. Now we come to questions because some information is always the same. The first candidate to answer may have up to two minutes and each following candidate will have up to one minute. Um, you're supposed to add to what's already been said or disagree with it. Um, and it's okay to say, I agree, and give us more time. We only have an hour, including openings and closings, so don't feel that you have to use all your time, and you did very well in opening statements. So for question one, since we rotate, John Penner will answer first, and Matthew Smith last. So, Josh Penner. Josh Penner, sorry, I said John. No problem. <laughs> According to the Washington State Budget and Policy Center, people with low and middle incomes in Washington State pay six times more in state and local taxes as a share of their income than the wealthiest 1%, making our tax system the most regressive in the nation. What measures would you propose or support to improve our tax system to make it adequate and equitable? Well, it, when you ask that question, um, some of my thoughts immediately go to housing equity, um, employment equity, things along those lines, right? Can we, can we afford to live where we live, can we afford to get to work or do we live where we live because that's where we have to live even though we have to commute two hours. I'll tell you right away that um, I know that a lot of the discussion in the room for balancing our budget in the future is around an income tax. <laughs> Completely against that. I don't think we need an income tax. I also know that we're looking at potential increases of real estate excise taxes, estate taxes, um, and B&O taxes. I don't think those are the way to uh, create a more fair distribution of tax income either. I've always been a fan of the sales tax simply because if you live like a prince, you pay like a prince. And if you live like a pauper, um, more or less you pay like a pauper. That being said, um, I can see though that you know somebody that has to spend a disproportionate amount of a very limited income on, on basic needs might end up paying more of their income in taxes. And uh, you know, I, I've always been um, into the idea of, of figuring out how to provide solutions for those 
those folks, right? Uh, things that we need to look at, I believe, are uh, fair tax standards for, for basic needs um, and also uh, some, some ways to get away from uh, having to pay burdensome property taxes for folks who are on limited income. We have a large number of folks that are on uh, 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 limited income, whether social security, VA disability, um, or retirement here in the district. And so we do have folks that are getting priced out of their homes just by the increase in property taxes. Uh, we need to understand that folks that are on limited income are the ones that are most unable to pay for rising taxes, whether it's sales taxes, real estate excess taxes, um, or property taxes. And we need to craft state policy to address that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Rhonda Litzenberger, and one minute for each of the rest of you. Yes, I, um, I agree that really uh, trying to, as we're trying to write a sinking ship, uh, that adding the additional tax burdens such as capital gains or income tax would not be the right uh, way to address that. I do believe that we're gonna have to address some regulatory reforms, perhaps tax abatement for our most vulnerable populations. Um, and we're, as we're looking to restart the economy, we're gonna also have to look at really deferring some taxes so that those who can't afford it at this time will have the opportunity uh, to really get their feet on the ground uh, before they have to start paying the government again. We're gonna need to, um, put a freeze on some government hiring and uh, budget increases and those kind of things. It's really more important for us right now uh, to, I think the most important social program is a job and we need to make sure that jobs are there and established for our communities. Thank you. Thank you. Gina Blanchard-Reed. Okay, thank you. I, I would agree that uh, the most important thing is getting uh, people working again and can, you know that way they're uh, providing for their families. I am against any kind of change to our, our tax system at this time. I, I think that that would, to add uh, taxes or to change our system um, and add a state's income tax would not be good. Um, as far as the safety net, that's why I've been involved in nonprofit work. I do think we need to support our local nonprofits and uh, make sure that they are able to do um, the work of providing um, services and, and intervention and rent assistance for people that are struggling. So I believe in early intervention and making sure their nonprofits are supported to help the, the people that, that truly need it. Thank you, Matthew Smith. Okay, so one of the, one of the biggest challenges we face as um, Washingtonians uh, when it comes to our taxes is the taxes keep going up and up and up. Um, if uh, you're struggling to pay your property tax, oftentimes it's because of uh, the state deciding we're going to put more money into this program. One of the things we saw recently is um, levy increases. We, we have funded schools constitutionally, and then they came back and allowed our uh, taxes to be raised up to 250 per thousand. So that's a big problem. And, you know, like, as I said, seniors, those on disability, they can't go out and earn more money to make up for those taxes. So I'm for a stay on property taxes. We need to stop raising property taxes so people can stay in their houses. Fuel taxes for working people is also a, a big one. People commuting, they can't afford to get to work because of, of our fuel taxes, paying for trains, paying for all these other things that we've thrown into this magical budget for, uh, for solving traffic problems. So there's, there's a lot of things we need to look at. Thank you. Next question, Rhonda Litzenberger will answer first. What financial challenges do you see as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic and how will you prioritize spending during the recovery? Uh, I think our financial situation is going to be really, um, really significant. And we are all going to have to look at tightening our budgets. Again, regulatory reform is going to be really important. We're going to have to look at putting freezes on government and hiring um, and budget increases. Uh, we are going to have to really look at sustainable um, opportunities for small businesses. They really are the backbone of industry. And our current economic structure is really based on a successful and robust economy. And we have pre-COVID, we have had the most robust economy in the nation. And I think as we look, as we move forward, it makes so much more sense to continue to support those structures that are already in place rather than burning down the economy completely and reaching out to new industry to try to replace that income. So I think really making sure that we have jobs available and opportunities for people to create income and to spend that income uh, in a way that provides for their families. Thank you. Thank you. Gina Blanchard-Reed. Yeah, I think it's an opportunity to really consider what is the most essential and basic role of government. And um, I think that, that that's where we need to start. We need to make sure our communities are safe, that uh, our 
law enforcement law enforcement officers are uh, that we are funding those uh, uh, and also um, our infrastructure um, transportation is important and schools and I, I really think it comes down to making government more, government more efficient and more um, transparent making sure that we're um, just looking at top to bottom, everything that how we're doing it. I know with my work working for D having involvement with DSHS, there's a lot of inefficiencies and things that could be updated technology wise that um, would make, I think, governor, uh, government more lean. Thank you. Thank you. Matthew Smith. So well, the running up against an $8.8 .8 billion deficit, at least that's what's forecasted so far. Um, a lot of that has come from uh, people not working. Our B&O tax is the second largest uh, revenue um, source in Washington state. So we need to first and foremost, get people back to work. Um, also giving small business the tools to thrive. I, I am for streamlining the B&O system. The B&O tax across the state is, is very confusing. So if we can simplify it, and we can free those small businesses to get back to work and people to get back to work, I think that uh, a recovery is a much easier um, line to haul. We're gonna all gonna have to be in this together. And if our state is going to do so, we need to uh, free up small business to get back to work. Thank you. Josh Penner. Thank you. So, you know, I, I agree with the, the basic layout folks have already stated, and I completely agree with uh, helping out small business to help us recover from this. I do want to point to a perspective, though, I think that has not been spoken, and that's the, the local and county level support. Um, you know, as we look to recovery, we're going to be looking at county budgets and city budgets that are going to be in a very tough situation. And it's going to take years for them to, to respond and reflect the reality of the recovery. During that time, we're going to see a significant drop in the ability to spend on important things like public safety, um, uh, whether that's police or fire, or even some basic education funding through, the, through bonds and levies. So we need a top-down restructuring of our entire funding system for local government um, to make it more fair, more responsive, and more locally controlled. And um, so that way, folks in local government, um, you know, the cities, the people you call to repair your potholes, they can actually get things done. So we need to have better, better communication between the state um, and where people live in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next question, Gina Blanchard-Reed will answer first. What should the legislature do to address the impacts of climate change and sea level rises, and how will you help that happen? Well, first of all, I think we need to base our decisions on uh, science and make sure that we're not um, uh, reacting and uh, to, to um, just sort of emotional. Um, and also we need to make sure that uh, we're involving every industry in terms of, we don't wanna uh, go overboard with our regulations. I was talking with someone this week um, that's an expert in stormwater and um, I, I, it was an eye opener for me to hear about um, all the regulations that go and how that impacts our businesses and the building industry and other local uh, businesses like auto recyclers. And um, so I do think that we need to, um, we, we all want a safe environment. We all want to be able to breathe and that's, that's not debatable, but I think we need to make sure that our decisions that impact our economy are balanced with uh, um, just common sense. So, and I think we need to involve those people that um, have to deal with those regulations and uh, make sure that they're, they're giving their input as well. So um, I, it all comes down to just actual data and facts and uh, we need to start there and take a step back and, and make sure that um, it's all in balance. Thank you. Matt Smith. All right, well, I'm probably the one that has the most experience when it comes to, uh, to dealing with this. Uh, I do have a degree from Evergreen State College and I focused on climate science and climate physics. So um, there, it's undoubtable that there is a climate change, right? But where we often see from governments is a top-down approach. It's subsidizing uh, prices and things like that. It's, you know, we saw recently with um, mass transit being pushed in South Sound and being up, uh, getting folks to work easier. But we need a market approach. Um, and we often push down, you know, uh, taxes from our government, but we need to be looking at uh, individuals um, ability to actually mitigate those, those issues that we're going to run into. Sea level rise, we're not going to be able to stop. So maybe we shouldn't build along uh, water. 
<laughs> Thank you, Josh Penner. Thank you. Uh, so, you know, we we have a very rural district out here in the second, and I have never met anybody um, conservative, uh, liberal, or any any other color of the spectrum we have out here that says that I want to trash our environment. In fact, we have a, we have a community of hunters. We have a community of outdoors people. We have a community of people that enjoy nature, and that's why they live here. Um, and so we, you know, we we see the climate. We care about the climate. Um, we might have disagreements on policy. I think the fundamental disagreement about policy comes to whether you believe that a stick is the best way to enact policy, meaning some kind of punishment for some perceived misdeed, or an incentive, meaning we all value these things. We all value a healthy environment, and here's how we can incentivize our businesses and our communities to reach that. You know, Gina talked about stormwater management. I could tell you the cities in our district discharge water cleaner into the rivers than it goes into their it goes into their water system. And so we already have a great deal of environmental stewardship. Um, and I think we can lead in this discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Rhonda Litzenberger. Thank you. Um, I really do believe that this is a district full of people who love the environment and are true conservationists at heart. I think that we are going to need to empower individuals who have really innovative ideas around env environmental solutions and really listen to them, bring those stakeholders together. I also think it would be important to require environmental spending to be met uh, uh, to meet effectiveness benchmarks. And I think it, if we um, work together and again, incentivize a lot of the innovation that's going on, I think we're going to be able to uh, as a state move forward with a healthier environment. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Matthew Smith answers this one first, so you can unmute yourself. Uh, what can and should the legislature do to address homelessness and affordable housing, and how will you influence that? Well, I'll touch on affordable housing first, since that's probably the, the largest key to our homeless situation outside of mental health. Um, we've had a we've had a problem here in Washington State since the GMA, the Growth Management Act, has been enacted, and it's it's causing property values to skyrocket. You can no longer you can no longer truly afford um, to build inside the GMA because those those properties have become so expensive to to um, to develop that you're in it fifty sixty thousand dollars before you can get a shovel in the ground. So. Um, Really, not breaking down the the GMA, but maybe en enacting different uh, regulations allow us to develop just outside the GMAs. My my proposal would probably be to to allow um, developers to build along numbered highways that are adjacent to GMAs that run straight out from the GMA that can still allow bus transit. So we have a, we I mean we can see the problem. That we have with housing in Washington State, we're not building house. We weren't building house for two months when we're you know two hundred thousand houses short of what we need. Uh, what we need to be having for people to to stay in their homes. Um, when it comes to the homelessness, um, I think that uh, there are some things that our inner cities have done to break down the uh, law and justice and not actually help people to get off of the streets. Not everybody ends up on the street because they've done something bad. Sometimes it's it's because uh, you know uh, something happened in their life and they ended up living in a car because they couldn't afford to stay in their house. So, like I said, I focused on housing because that's number one. We obviously need to continue to invest in mental health as well and get those folks off of the streets. And they're going to want to though. They're going to have to want to. We can't just pull them off the streets. It, it's their constitutional right to stay where they're at. Thank you. Josh Penner. Thank you. As a member, a founding member and steering committee member of the South Sound Housing Affordability Partners, this is something that I've been working through quite a bit in the last two years. Uh, you know, when we're talking about folks experiencing homelessness or we're talking about housing affordability, it all comes down to the same issues uh, here in our district. And that's really housing stock diversity. We have a district full of people who through the Growth Management Act um, have essentially been forced to live out here and work in the central Puget Sound to afford it. Um, and that creates a bunch of houses that are between three hundred and seven hundred thousand dollars and that's not changing. Entry level uh, home buyers can't buy into this market. Um, folks who are on fixed incomes can't afford to stay in the market. And so the best thing we can do from the state legislative perspective is to continue things like what we did in the, like what the legislators done in the past year and providing opportunities for cities and counties to create policy, 
around housing stock diversity, whether that's lot size averaging, allowing for duplexes, um, at ADU enhancement, so accessory dwelling units like a, a grand a, a mother-in-law cottage, things like that on, on property that people own. So essentially allow people to use the property they've already purchased for the needs of the housing market. Thank you. Thank you, Rhonda Litzenberger. Well, I agree with everything that Josh just said. Um, again, my husband and I have been small uh, construction development business owners for the last 30 years. Our primary target industry has been first-time home buyers and affordable homes. Uh, it is true that growth management has, because there is just uh, less land available, buildable land available, we really need to look at a, di a diversity of zoning so that we can increase that without a uh, great impact. We also, I think, really need to um, incentivize growth around transit centers and uh, near job centers. It's great if we can have the opportunity to really uh, yearly reflect on the growth management and reset the goals, and that needs to be by, uh, kind of a multifaceted state and local work working together to reset those goals. Thank you. Thank you. Gina Blanchard Reed. So in the nonprofit work that I've done the last 20 years, every single um, uh, agency has dealt with the homelessness issue. The, the, the clients that we work with, that's the number one, um, obviously in a domestic violence situation. And uh, a lot of times it's that they have uh, um, poor credit. And so I would love to see um, more incentives for um, uh, people, landlords to work with those folks. But really the bottom line is it's a supply and demand issue and we need to make it less costly for people. I have friends that are in construction and are contractors and they've, you know, if, if it's too risky or too expensive, they're not gonna uh, be as um, uh, interested in putting that out there. So I do think we need to lessen some of the regulations and permitting process needs to be sped up. And I also agree taking a look at the GMA uh, more often and readjusting because we, we have people that need homes and we need to make sure that we're um, allowing for those developers to, to, have, to be able to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone has had a chance to answer first. So now we're gonna go in alphabetical order by last name. So it will be Gina Blanchard-Reed, then Rhonda Litzenberger, Josh Penner, Matthew Smith. And interestingly, the next question deals with the GMA. The Growth Management Act governs development. Is there legislation you would propose to amend the GMA what and why? Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I would. I would like to see an amendment to that. Um, I think that um, living out here and kind of the, the cusp of um, a more dense area going into the rural areas, I do think that we need to expand that um, while obviously being aware of preserving um, our, um, you know, the, the beauty that we have around us and the space that we enjoy. Uh, one of my supporters lives out in uh, Rainier and I was talking with her. She owns about five or six acres and she's a single mom and kind of struggling. And I asked her about subdividing her lot and she's unable to do that because of regulations. She has to uh, parcel them off. And I think it's three or four acres, which wouldn't leave her with usable space. So um, I think that that's a situation where we need to be able to allow for um, uh, individuals to have more freedom to use their land the way they want to. Um, so I definitely think that we need to take a look at uh, reforming that and making adjustments to that in the their new future. So um, we, we we have to do something. There's uh, such a problem. This is an issue on, you know, besides the economy and the, the COVID situation, homelessness was the number one issue that people were talking about. So um, it's all tied together and we need to take a look at it. Thank you. Rhonda Litzenberger. Again, I really think that this is a two-pronged approach and a partnership with state and local governments. Uh, we really need to take a look at the growth management. It's been enacted for 25 years and it needs to be updated and we need to be reflective and innovative um, and really looking at the needs of each community uh, so that we can provide affordable housing. There are really too many regulatory barriers and I think if we were to streamline some of that, we would definitely help the industry and affordability of homes. Thank you. Josh Penner. Thank you. Uh, so I represent all the Pierce County cities on the Puget Sound Regional Council Growth Management Board. And what folks uh, that are watching this might not know is that the city that you apply to or the county that you apply to for your comprehensive plan amendment, so you can do things like subdivide your lot or change the zoning, all have to be approved through a paradigm that's set by the folks in King County. They have enough votes in King County to outnumber all of us that live out here outside of King County, and they do on a regular basis. And that's why I represent our community up there is because I'm an outspoken advocate for our community in this issue. I think Matthew's point about being able to develop what we can't develop is, is well taken. Uh, right now in our district, there's very little, little developable land, and we have a district that is the fastest growing area in the state. So the two of those run headlong into each other. You have a population that's exploding because of 
places where they can afford to live and you have a population that can't work here because we can't develop where they live. Um, Growth Management Act needs to be rebuilt from the bottom to the top. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew Smith. So like I said before, the GMA does need to be uh, reevaluated a little bit. Um, and uh, we do, we have, we have one of the fastest growing areas in the state. And uh, so reevaluating the way that we can develop um, around our municipalities is gonna be important. Reevaluating the way that rural areas develop is gonna be important uh, for affordability. Uh, we're going to have to look at the GMA pretty seriously. So, uh, you know, property rights, uh, allowing people to use the land in the way that, uh, you know, they see fit used to be okay. But once we get the GMA in, now we can't do that. I've seen some last work, the work in the last session to allow ADUs and allow, uh, so addition, additional dwelling units on property. So that would help within the GMA, but outside that doesn't help. We need to, to seriously reevaluate evaluate the GMA and uh, work, work with our rural areas. Thank you. Thank you all. So we'll rotate Gina Blanchard Smith to the end. So Rhonda Litzenberger will speak first to this one. Got a hybrid there. <laughs> with the passage of I-976 affecting transportation budgets, what measures do you propose to repair, maintain, and improve transportation infrastructure? Um, I think that it is, if we're really going to uh, tackle uh, the congestion issues, we're just going to have to put more lanes on the road. That's just bottom line. That's what's going to take. And that is really should be um, borne by those people who are using it. And so I do believe that uh, a sales tax revenue that is specifically um, attached to transportation is really the most feasible and economic way. And I believe that studies have shown that uh, if we transfer that sales tax and commit that revenue to transportation, that that will be uh, a good way to supplement and uh, to move that work forward. Thank you. Thank you. Josh Penner. Thank you. This is a great question. It's great because it, after 976, there was one municipality that lowered car tab fees within their boundaries, and that was the city of Ording. And they did so with my request to the city council that passed my re recommendation unanimously. And so Ording, of course, pays lower car tab taxes than everybody else um, because of that. Now there's two pieces right to 976. A big part of it was a fight back against sound transit. I think that everyone in this discussion would agree sound transit is ridiculous, but most people in our district don't pay sound transit fees. So now we're talking about the rest of our car tabs and equitability and transportation funding. Uh, my perspective, it really comes down to concurrency. Concurrency means that if you're building a big development in an area, the, the, the impact fees that you pay should go to pay for improvements in that area. And that's not the case. That's not the way it works through WASDOT. So while we have a, a huge amount of growth in our district, the money that's supposed to go in transportation doesn't stay in our district. It goes outside of our district to other projects that have bigger voices than we do. Mm -hmm. So concurrency is, I think, where we can advocate best as the next senator. Thank you. Thank you. Matthew Smith, muted. Yep, and I would actually agree with Josh on the impact fees. Uh, keeping, keeping that money local so uh, municipalities can actually develop um, ways to keep uh, you know, our roads more efficient is gonna be an extremely important. We can't just uh, have sales tax and property tax and impact fees and everything go to the general fund. We, we just can't do that. Um, so, I would actually, for, for an immediate response to that, would be to try to incentivize um, businesses and keeping their folks working from home. Keeping people off the road is gonna be the best way to do this. Um, yes, we have people that can't work from home, construction industry, service industries, they, they can't work from home. But there is a lot of industry that can, that can continue to work from home. And we also need to make housing more affordable where people are working. We can't continue to raise prices and raise prices and raise prices and not expect people to move out of the area and continue to work where they're, uh, where they're working. Thank you. Well, as, as, someone, as someone who travels through uh, three counties to get to work, um, I, I would agree with Matthew. It's been refreshing to be able to actually travel without slowing down, uh, down I-5, and that is due to people working from home. 
And I have heard from a lot of businesses that are going to rethink that. So that's, that's a side issue, but we do need more roads. We need to prioritize where we're putting our dollars for transportation. And I think people are just leery of government. When, when uh, we have new taxes that go to transportation, we never see more roads. So uh, it's, it's good that the gas tax actually um, under the constitution has to go towards those projects. Um, while I'm not in favor of new taxes, um, I just think that we need to make sure that we're, we are doing what we're saying we're doing. And we need to be more thoughtful more in planning earlier. We have big developments coming here um, in the second district and the, um, between Ording and Graham. And I don't know where these people are gonna go. And so I think that uh, there needs to be a little bit more uh, coordination. And uh, we also need to make sure that we are actually putting the money where we need it. And that is uh, getting more roads and uh, widening those roads and finishing projects on time as well. Thank you. Uh, Josh Penner will answer this question first. What is your position on single payer health care for all in Washington state and why? And how can we best assure that all Washingtonians get needed medical care? Well, uh, you know, I, I exist in a couple different health care systems. I exist in my wife's coverage um, through the state. You know, she's a teacher and I, I utilize that insurance. And of course, I'm a service connected veteran and I utilize the VA. And so I've experienced two different models of health care. And I think that they both have upsides and some very serious downsides. Um, what I would like to see is an opportunity for folks to be able to purchase health care in the same sense that they can purchase uh, car insurance or any other um, item provided by the market. I believe that if we open up our market across state lines, we're going to see more equi equitability or equ equity rather in, in, in healthcare options. I think one of the challenges that we've seen come from the federal government is that there's a required minimum level um, of healthcare options that doesn't apply very well for everybody, right? So a, a man in his 50s um, certainly does not need the same healthcare needs as a young woman in her 20s. Um, maybe more, maybe less, but certainly different. Um, and so we need to have a market that responds, re, uh, responds well to both of those needs um, and doesn't try to meet both at the same time for additional cost. Um, and so, you know, my perspective on healthcare is we need to empower market solutions. Um, and the best way we can do that initially, I think, is by allowing, uh, allowing us to purchase healthcare insurance individually across state lines. Thank you. Thank you. Matthew Smith. And, uh, you know, I would ditto Josh on that. Um, we, we absolutely need to take a market approach to this. And part of that market approach is not just uh, allowing a, a wider market and the opportunity for individuals to choose their coverage, but to also uh, have some transparency in the way things are billed. We can't just have miscellaneous charges for $20,000 on, on a bill. Uh, we need to break that down and we need to have a market approach. Everywhere else, you can go, you can, you, when you're going out and choosing a car, you choose the features. You choose exactly what you want. Um, when we're looking to go get our car serviced. We go and we choose the mechanic that, that is the cheapest price. We don't do that for medical. Um, we just kind of let our insurance companies uh, you know, write a check because it's not coming out of our pocket. Well, that's why things have got so expensive and we, and we need to, uh, to take a serious look at the way our medical insurances are operating. Thank you. Gina Blanchard-Reed. All right. So um, I do think it does. Ha we do have um, the need for some people that really can't afford insurance. I, I see that every day at work. And um, and so I, I do think it's great to have that safety net. But I'm also a free market person. I think competition uh, drives down costs if we open it up, um, give more options and allow people to customize their plans. And um, I think that we just that that works in so many ways. And it certainly um, I remember years ago when the Affordable Care Act was passed, I had private insurance and my rates went up so much that I had to cancel and go without insurance for a couple of years. And so I'm thankful that um, the job I have now, I have that uh, health savings account, which I think is great. I think it's a wonderful option that, um, that more people should look at. So again, it's the, it's the um, competition that's going to drive down costs and make it more affordable for other people. But I do think we need to have systems in place um, for people that truly can't afford it or have jobs that provide that in a way that's sufficient for them. Thank you. Rhonda Litzenberger. 
I agree that with every <clears throat> with, with what everyone has said about the free market insurance, but I do believe that this is a multi-pronged issue and it's going to take a multifaceted approach. Not only is it going to take free market insurance um, and loosening the requirements and health metrics and opportunity for competition, but we're really going to have to look at innovations such as telemedicine when appropriate. We're going to have to look at licensing reciprocity for our, our healthcare providers. Um, we're going to need to look at tort reform. So many of the uh, testing that goes so much of the testing that goes on right now it really is defensive medicine and it's very very expensive um, we need to look at how pharma is uh, the costs of introducing new medications and so we need to look at regulations around that and i think we need to enact reforms to modernize and strengthen medicare we have a whole generation of people who are looking forward and relying on that we need to make sure that it's uh, reformed and ready to go for those individuals thank you thank you okay um matthew smith will answer this one first then Gina Blanchard Reed and on down. What should the legislature do to prepare for the next pandemic or other regional emergencies such as earthquake or volcanic eruption? I, I think we're actually doing a lot of that now and that's actually having the stores we need to, to react. Um, I think we have a lot of the data now to, to support having you know uh, counties prepare for this. We've, the governor has kind of pushed um, the responsibility on the counties, whether they open up, and I think it is a local approach. Um, our counties are, I don't know if our cities necessarily, and besides the big urban areas, um, but our counties need to um, have the foresight to uh, see some of those challenges. Uh, we, have, we have some pretty compelling data to work off of now uh, when it comes to the pandemic. Um, and, we, and also, um, from the Mount St. Helens eruption, I mean, we could be looking at uh, earthquake data from, you know, 2000. Our areas are more resilient after the fact because hindsight is always 2020. We have the data, and now it's uh, it's each individual county's uh, time to respond to that. Thank you, Peter Blanchard Reed. Well, I also think that it starts even more um, locally, and that would be with individual families. I think that just uh, uh, a more awareness of um, programs um, in terms of emergency management, making sure that families and businesses and uh, communities are preparing for themselves, um, and, and then moving upward to, to our cities, our um, local fire districts, and, um, and then counties. Um, and then I think there needs to be sort of um, just a, we need to understand that we need to have a food, water, uh, emergency uh, plans as far as evacuation. And um, I think that this has kind of been an eye-opener, an opportunity to pivot and for people to uh, reevaluate their own uh, their own lives, um, conversations on how they could um, best prepare. Um, so again, it's another local issue. And I think that um, I, I'm confident that this is going to um, be a good thing in the long run and maybe save, um, if something were to happen, um, allow us to be safer in the future. Thank you. Rhonda Litzenberger. I agree, personal responsibility is really coming to be one of the forefront um, issues that we all are going to have learned personally from this. I think there's some other lessons that we've learned from this pandemic. Part of that is that we really need to take some legislative action around um, the emergency powers of our governor and so that the legislature can be really viable partners in the conversation. So I think we really need to enact uh, maybe some legislation that says there's a limit on the amount of time that the governor can have emergency powers. I think we need to capitalize on some of the other lessons that we've learned. And um, we've seen that there's been great inequity in our educational system because of the broadband issue. And that's something that we're really going to need to address. It's not the school system's responsibility to provide broadband to everyone, but we know that it has become an essential requirement of our uh, communities. Um, and I think that we also will each community and county and state will be better prepared moving in the future uh, with PPEs and all of those things for the next issues that we face. Thank you. Thank you, Josh Penner. Thank you. I, I might be uniquely able to answer this from, a, from an emergency management perspective and an executive perspective as the city, the largest city in the path of Mount Rainier's uh, Lahar in the future. We've had a very keen focus on emergency planning for a number of years, certainly since I've become the mayor and in doing so, We've worked to reduce the amount of times it takes, uh, amount of time it takes to evacuate our citizens, uh, up to 30% in the last three years, and so uh, that required coordination with fire districts, police, uh, uh, police departments, 
um, private industry, uh, even local ham radio clubs. So it requires uh, cross-jurisdictional cross and uh, uh, communication and coordination. That being said, I've been to the legislature for years now saying that emergency preparedness is a priority and it's very clear a lot of those folks don't come into that job understanding that now everybody has an experience of what it looks like to respond to an emergency and at times what it looks like to respond poorly to an emergency. Um, I think now is a perfect opportunity to re-engage that conversation among the whole Senate. I'm the candidate to do that. Thank you. Thank you. All right, <clears throat> this will be our last question in random order. It will, the order will be, of answering will be Josh Penner, Gina Blanchard-Reed, Matthew Smith, Rhonda Litzenberger, just to mess it up. Salmon recovery and enhancement projects call for removal of the Snake River dams and oppose the Chehalis River flood retention facility. What's your position on these and why? Josh Penner. So uh, we, have, we have many Salmonberry rivers and streams in our district. Um, and so it certainly is something that's very important to us. It's part of our cultural heritage. It's part of our natural environment. It touches on that question about what do we believe in the environment. Um, protecting our salmon runs is important, not just for the salmon, but for the entire ecosystem of our rivers um, and those animals that rely on the ecosystem, like our eagles and, and, and things along those lines. Um, you know, uh, this is a perfect example of where compromises need to be met. A lot of the rhetoric around discussion regarding, regarding salmon recovery or um, usage of those rivers really has, uh, has um, moved towards very absolute positions. Um, I'll tell you, in the city of Ording, we have two salmon bearing rivers surrounding us. Um, one of them you can fish, one of them you can't. Um, I've met with folks who are looking to seed the rivers further upstream um, and have, been, have run into a lot of uh, challenges even doing that. Um, so I can't really speak to the Snake River issue. Um, it's outside the district. It's outside my experience. And I'm going to be honest about that. I do believe that we need to have open ears and have discussions regarding all of these issues around um, sal salmon habitat, salmon ha habitat recovery. So thank you for the question. I wish I could provide a more substantial answer, but I'm certainly open to it, open to hearing what others that are more knowledgeable have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Gina Blanchard Reed. Right. So I, I think that it's important to make sure we're having a variety of people in the discussion, including our, our local tribes and those that rely on that industry. Um, but we, you know, going back to the uh, climate change issue and um, uh, other environmental issues, we, we all want um, our, the world that we live in to be safe and clean and we want that for our salmon, but we just need a balance in terms of um, our businesses. And um, so I just think it, it comes down to that. Um, again, I was had a conversation with a man that was an expert in stormwater and um, understanding how um, there's some testing right now that isn't really even um, accurate. And so I think we need to look at uh, how we're training folks to do that, that um, uh, make sure there's uh, adequate training for people that are doing that testing so that uh, we have real information before we make decisions. Um, and I, like Josh, I don't know that much about the dams. Um, before any changes though, we, we have to make sure we're involving everybody in the conversation. Thank you, Matthew Smith. Yeah, this is definitely a, uh, a subject where people tend to be uh, polar. Um, so choosing one side or the other, uh, because, you know, this dam is standing in the way of salmon, this, this dam is, you know, feeding, uh, feeding our state because of the water it provides to agriculture. Agriculture is a big industry in our state. So obviously, um, removing any of our dams is going to have a, a big impact, not just on ag, but on, on power production. We are, uh, we're a state that has 75% of our, of our power coming from renewable resources and our dams are part of that. So um, I'm definitely not for just, you know, a uh, all out removal. Um, I'm sure there are ways that we can work with uh, fish elevators and other things to get the salmon upstream. Um, but also looking at climate change where we look at uh, water flow and in the spring that water is coming a lot faster and we need the dams to add to add a, uh, a speed bump. So um, removal of the dams has more impact than, than we think it does. Thank you. Rhonda Litzenberger. I think that uh, salmon restoration is something near and dear to my heart. I think there's several things that we can do. I, I do not agree with removing the Snake River Dam, but I do know that there are important issues that we need to really uh, work and partner with communities. We need to reduce the competition with seals and sea lions. Uh, they 
use a lot of our uh, salmon resources. We need to increase hatchery production. And we also need to have farmers become a part of uh, this conversation and be partners in this work. I know that uh, we have partnered with the Nisqually Indian tribe on two of the farmlands that we have as we have uh, watched salmon restoration. And I am so happy to say that the Ohop Creek, which we've worked very diligently, um, is now seeing a salmon run that wasn't there before. So I know that there are innovative ways that we can really restore that salmon without destroying um, what we've already gained economically with the dams. Thank you. Thank you. Now it's time for closing statements. Each candidate has up to one minute. We reverse the order of opening statements and so begin with Gina Blanchard Reed. Okay. Well, I, I appreciate the opportunity uh, this morning to uh, talk with all of you and appreciate the work that you do in forming our communities. I, um, I, I love to see more and more people get involved in the political process. I, I've been involved in grassroots politics since college days. And um, I, I always encourage you know, friends and family to get educated. So this is a perfect forum for that. And um, I just wanna reiterate that my top priorities are public safety, making sure we have a transparent and efficient government that's gonna reduce um, uh, just all the inefficiencies and also wanna make sure that um, uh, um, we also are protecting our personal liberties. Um, that, is, that is the basics of our constitution. And that would be our Second Amendment rights, making sure we have our property rights protected and that we have more freedoms to be able to live our lives and pursue our own happiness. And that's what I truly want to see for the Second District, for people to be happy and flourishing and prosperous. Thank you. Thank you. Rhonda Litzenberger. Legislative members know me as a person of integrity, conservative values, and strong moral character. For this reason, I've been honored to be endorsed by retiring Senator uh, Randy Becker and I know that there is tremendous power in building relationships on both sides of the aisle. This strength is one that will set me apart as your next senator. There are difficult days ahead. The ability to hold meaningful, persuasive dialogue with all stakeholders will be key. I will bring the same passion to the issues that impact the, impact the second legislative district that I've used in my advocacy for education. My personal experience has given me unique opportunities that have prepared me to be the best representative of the views and values of our district. These are trying times. As we stand together, we can make a difference. I am certain that there are better days ahead, and I know that we'll get there together. Thank you. Thank you. Josh Penner. Thank you. Uh, these forums are a great opportunity to get to know candidates on very specific items. Uh, the job of being a senator or any elected representative strays far outside of these very specific questions, and that's why it's important to understand the candidate's philosophy of governance. Um, I'm just going to describe to you very quickly mine, right? If you think of the idea of a bank, you make deposits in the bank, you take deposits out of the bank. I think of our government in the form of a trust bank. Now, you, the government can make deposits in that trust bank by recognizing who you are, responding to your concerns, and, and reflecting kind of your values and vision. They can take deposits out by doing things like taking money from you. They can take deposits out by doing things like uh, pricing you out of your home due to unfair property taxes. They can take deposits out all the time. My question to you is, are your representatives taking deposits out or making deposits into this trust bank? As your senator in Olympia, my job is going to be the same it's been as the mayor of Ording. Make deposits into that trust bank. So that way we can rebuild trust in our government and we can start that with leadership here in the second. Thank you so much. Thank you. Matthew Smith. All right. So my, my whole campaign has been focused around restoring the voice of the people. And I truly believe that, that our candidates would would all do that well. Um, but I think that I'm the most, uh, probably the most fair when it, come, when it comes to uh, my work background, my educational background. It's not that I'm gonna find a middle ground in all issues, but I am definitely an information gatherer. Uh, I like knowing the information before we move forward. Um, oftentimes we base our decisions on our feelings and emotions, but uh, you know, just like, just like the governor has said so many times when it comes to the shutdown, it has to be actually data driven. Um, I wouldn't agree with uh, what the governor said and a lot of that. Um, but we are looking at economic recovery that we are need, going to need to be innovative. We're gonna have to give uh, small business the tools to thrive and the tools to recover because uh, small business provides many more jobs to our state than large corporations do. Uh, we need to uphold uh, small business. We need to work through traffic issues. We're going to have to, once again, be innovative. We're going to have to adapt to the times. We are seeing the tools right now being executed, even within this forum, that allows us 
to adapt to the times. So traffic, big issue. Um, education, once again, we're gonna have to adapt and innovate. Thank you. Uh, so, and I think we have, we are seeing the tools used and um, we are going to uh, come together as a state to solve these problems. Thank you, that's Choice a long needs sentence. to come from the people. <laughs> thank you all. And thank you for sticking to times and um, being polite and everything else. Gina Blanchard-Reed, Rhonda Litzenberger, Josh Penner, and Matthew Smith are four of the six candidates for Washington State Senate in the second legislative district. Please vote for your choice in the primary election by August 4th. You should have your ballot by July 20th. I would like to thank the timekeeper, Terry Baker, Thurston Community Media for recording this and making it possible, and the voter service people from the Thurston County and Tacoma Pierce County Leagues of Women Voters. Please watch for other forums, read your voters pamphlet, look up vote411.org where you can find answers to questions posed to all candidates running for office in all races, read candidates' websites, and do all you can to be an educated voter. And having done all that, don't forget to vote. Primary ballots are due in by Tuesday, August 4th. Thank you all very much.